All right, it is start time. So let's go ahead and do the thing. Greetings everyone again. And thank you all so much for joining my presentation entitled, Keeping Your Open Source Projects Accessible to All. So this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. As I know I wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for the support, encouragement, and allyship of my free and open source software comrades, a couple of who are sitting in the audience right now. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to have opportunity to lend my voice to making our community even better. So thank you all so much for coming. All right, so now that all the sap is out of the way, is my breathing in this mask disturbing? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, cool. So now we got that all out of the way. Let's go ahead and get the show on the road. So you're probably wondering who the hell I am and why I'm holding this poor dog hostage. My name's Treva, and I am a technical community manager for a project called Cata Containers at Open Infra Foundation, formerly known as OpenStack Foundation. So I have an extremely short attention span, which has resulted in the development of a skill for describing complex things like eight words, which has gotten me pretty far in my career as I started out in the call center. So I was fortunate enough to get recruited out of that call center by a company called Rackspace, where I was introduced to something called OpenStack, which led to a full immersion into the world of open source and the rest was history. So it's been a hobby and now it's my job for a while to manage open source engagement for several open source projects, with the job ones having communities that were in an infancy stage that I was responsible for growing. Being who I am, DEI was a top priority. So I was thrilled to have what I saw as an opportunity to build these communities from the ground up with focus on recruiting and maintaining engagement with a truly diverse audience. DEI is also super important to my co-presenter, who's, yeah, I figured, napping right now. Um, <laughs> so this is Sir Harold B. Goggington III, AKA Goggy. He is Pink Penguin's chief cuddle officer, and he is my prescribed psychiatric support animal. So we're fortunate enough to have been at companies that are very, very um, accommodating and also have a lot of dog lovers on the board. So I get to take him everywhere with me. But the reason why I do that is to put a face to invisible disabilities and just to let you know that you never know what somebody else is going through. So always approach them with empathy and compassion. So getting into why we're here. So the reason why DEI is one of my main focuses, one of my main focuses is because I don't see very many black women in the circles that I travel. So I figured, why not use my position to do something about that? Seriously, over, I guess, five years now? I don't know if 2020 counts, but um, dozens of conferences, I've met maybe 10 other black engineers who identify as female. Now, I know there's more out there, but the important question that needs to be answered is why don't they want to be seen? So as maintainers for open source projects, we all want more diversity, which is why we're here. I think I've said that before. But where do you start with trying to find these individuals and how do you get their attention? Well, before we get to the solution, I have to throw some numbers at you to make this look more professional. Just stick with me here. I'll get to the good part in a second. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 23% of professional computer programmers identify as female. About 16% of respondents said that they belong to an ethnic or national minority group. And about 34% self-identified as black, Asian, or Latin American. Huh. When compared to overall US demographics, those numbers aren't great, but they're not all that awful either. Especially when compared to, stati stat when compared to statistics from 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Since virtually every programmer will touch some type of open source software over the course of their career, you'd expect contributor demographics to look about the same. Well, unfortunately, they don't. So back in 2017, GitHub surveyed about 5,500 open source users and developers from around the world on a range of topics, including demographic information. Out of the 5,500 randomly selected individuals who completed the survey, a full 95% of respondents identified as male, 3% identified as female, and only 1% identified as non-binary. What makes these numbers interesting is that most respondents also stated 
that most of their open source contributions are done on the job. So if we believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics that 23% of devs and programs are, programmers are female and almost 35% are people of color, why don't the demographics for open source contributions match? Seriously, what the heck's going on? Now, I don't, believe this is, I don't believe that this is happening as a result of there being a deliberate effort by the otherwise all welcoming open source community to exclude people of color, LGBTQIA+, or the differently abled. But clearly something is making members of marginalized groups hesitate to get involved. Excuse me, I gotta catch my breath. Could it be that uncomfortable work environments are souring people on open source before they even get involved? Because would-be contributors expect the same level of hostility, judgment, unfriendliness, etc., in open source peers as they get during their work hours? I mean, think about it. If you were on a job where your contributions and talents were minimized at best, or at worst, you were outright ignored and exploited by your cishet male peers, would you be all that excited about joining in on what we may assume is a similar environment during your personal time for free? Further, how do, we, how do we as open source software maintainers show that no, not only do we not tolerate that type of behavior in our communities, but there are also massive career benefits to being an open source contributor slash maintainer. So, I don't know if you can tell, but I just kind of wedged this in based off a conversation that I had very recently with a colleague. So I don't have any more content around that topic or around that point just yet, but hopefully we can save some time for the end to discuss it a little bit further. Now heading back over to our survey data, that lovely survey included a section where respondents could specify some of the reasons they decide not to contribute to open source projects. Some of those reasons include incomplete or missing documentation, dismissive responses, or no response at all from maintainers, conflict with other community members, unexplained rejection of contributions or ideas, and unwelcoming language or content. Now, while we don't have full control when a personality conflict may occur, like if someone takes it personally that a maintainer prefers DC over Marvel, I don't know why I thought that was so funny when I wrote it, but it's still in there. <laughs> What we do have control over is whether or not the responding to pull requests is prioritized or, if time doesn't permit, whether we do things like setting up auto responses and creating clear outlines that set proper expectations from the beginning. We can control whether we just close a quote unquote bad PR or whether we seize that opportunity to mentor a budding developer. What else do we have control over? Updating the daggum docs. Bad documentation was the highest reported deterrent across the board for getting involved in open source. From personal experience, I can tell you that, especially when I was a baby sysadmin, nothing was more frustrating or discouraging than attempting to read through documentation for a software that read like somebody had cut out each word, put the words in a jar, shaken it around, dumped it out on the floor, and then transcribed whatever happened. <laughs> Keep in mind that there's an increasing population of sysadmins, developers, and engineers who are basically self-taught. They're clearly extremely intelligent and driven, but they may not understand or even care about topics like Turing completeness or the mathematical equation used to calculate exactly how many fragments an OSD is broken into before it's being spread across hosts, unless and until it's explained to them. Clear, concise documentation is arguably the best and most important component for attracting new contributors. So please, update your documentation. And more specifically, don't make assumptions about what your audience knows. If you think you're over-explaining, you're probably not. It's always better to over-explain than under, trust me. <sighs> oh, these masks are so hard to breathe through. But they look great, don't they? Better yet, have someone look over the docs with fresh eyes to ask the questions that someone new to the project would ask. You'd be surprised how many complexities you don't give a second thought to because you do them all the time, and therefore you leave them out of your instructions. While you're advancing those docs, simplify it when you can. 
One of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein is, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Now that might come across kind of insulting and harsh, but as I mentioned, some of us are self-taught. Some aren't native English speakers, and folks are getting into open source younger and younger. We don't want to discourage or frighten them off with quick starts that read like quantum calculus. Which leads to the next bullet point, create a glossary. So for example, OpenStack Glance is a project that has excellent examples of this in action. OpenStack in general has a massive, active, passionate, and very diverse contributor list with skill levels varying from thinking YAML is a type of yogurt to I wrote 90% of the code for ironic bare metal because I was bored. And the person who did that is actually here. I think she gave a keynote yesterday um, because their documentation is top tier. As a member of the no CS degree gang, I, it was immensely helpful to have a glossary of terms directly related to the projects I was working on available. Because sometimes Google will lead you down a rabbit hole completely unrelated to whatever it is that you're actually looking for, which can be a time sink and super boring. Having those resources readily available is a great way to foster more community engagement. And while you're implementing those changes, don't forget the differently abled. Something as simple as adding a WordPress plugin can make, the difference, make all the difference in the world for someone who is vision impaired or has a learning disability. The example gift is a demo of an accessibility plugin that I'm particularly fond of, created by a company called UserWay, which has several accessibility options to adjust contrast, font size, animation, and even includes an option to switch page fonts for easier readability for those with dyslexia. As a person afflicted with dyslexia, I didn't realize how much of a strain it was to follow the words on the screen until I didn't have to do it anymore, which was incredible, especially as an adult. Even small things like adding a WordPress plugin can make a huge difference in that first impression you make on potential contributors. So please always keep that in mind. Am I going too fast? Okay, good. <sighs> Relatively small adjustments to how you choose to document and present your code is the most critical factor in increasing engagement with your project, not just for members of marginalized groups, but in general, which is what we all want, right? Yeah, so while you're at it, be mindful of exclusionary or otherwise icky language, like using the mostly deprecated master slash slave to describe controller and nodes, for example. Now, I'm not here to kink shame anyone, but the terms are uncomfortable for a number of reasons, for a number of different groups. Another example would be using gendered language, like you guys, when addressing a group of people. Try to err on the side of caution and use neutral alternatives whenever possible. When you start getting all this wonderful, diverse talent contributing to your projects, it's important to acknowledge them, not just to celebrate that specific person, but also to encourage and inspire others who, for whatever reason, may mistakenly believe that they're unable to do the thing because of who they are or where they're from. Just don't be weird about it. <laughs> for example, if you only acknowledge women in your community on International Women's Day and ignore them for the rest of the year, that's weird. If you only acknowledge black contributors in February and ignore them the rest of the year, that's weird. <laughs> Seriously, it's very uncomfortable for the person or persons involved, whether they say it out loud or not, and it just looks really bad to people that are looking from the inside, or from the outside, I'm sorry. Instead, make an effort to celebrate people of color, femmes, LGBTQIA+, and other marginalized groups just because they did something great, not during a specific time. The greatest thing about open source is that we're all open to helping one another. If you're not sure how to keep from crossing that line, lean on the community for advice. Those of us working towards true equity will be glad to help. Next point, be responsive. Now this might seem like an obvious statement, but when those PRs and issues start pouring in, respond to them. Completely ignored PRs honestly isn't something that I've personally seen very often, but unfortunately it does occasionally still occur. 
Slower no response to questions, pull requests, and feature requests is the best way to make an individual write your project off forever. Now, I know this is easier said than done, especially if you're managing one or several open source projects in addition to work, family, social life, what is that, and other obligations. But responding with a quick few words or even adding tags or some other interaction as acknowledgement can make all the difference in a baby dev's perception of our community. So even if you don't merge immediately, try to respond within like 24 to 48 hours, or at least set proper expectations. If it's not possible to replicate yourself enough times to be able to respond to every message in 30 minutes or the piece is free, add a section to the README or to your community guidelines page that gives a general timeline of when you'll be able to reach out to that new contributor. Also, complete the README. It irks me to no end to see nothing but project name and some lorem ipsum or something, equally as unrelated to the GitHub page, or even worse, for the README to have five-year-old info that conflicts with the original documentation just enough to ruin your <laughs> demo setup. So please, update your README. So you know the saying, there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? Well, I like to expand that to there's no such thing as a bad PR, which to me means that every proposed feature or fix deserves at least some consideration. You don't know for sure whether or not the individual reaching out is off track or if they just have issues expressing their ideas until and unless you follow up. So do that. To give an in real life example, one of my former colleagues named John Murphy, I have to say the whole thing, and his incredible response to a massive, ambitious pull request to one of replicated my former company's open source projects that he spent a month carefully reviewing, TLDR. Not only did the project get several, several cool new features after he was done, but we, well, replicated got a new employee who started, I think, in February, and he's been doing great so far. And that is all because of John Murphy's willingness to dive into a single PR and take time to mentor who ended up being a massive resource for Replicated. So thank you so much to John Murphy for being a shining example of what open source community is like. And congratulations, Alexander, <laughs> for getting a new job. So in addition to boosting engagement numbers, it's been proven that there's diverse workplaces in tech with all those different skill sets, perceptives, perspectives, and experiences generate more money and innovation faster than racially homogenous and all or mostly male companies. OpenStack, got to go back to them again, with their massive and diverse contributor list grew from five projects to dozens of community contributed projects frequently used as basis for a whole bunch of your favorite cloud platforms. And it's a perfect example of what can be achieved when we work together. So that's all I got for now. And I'm kind of out of breath from this mask. Thank you all so much for joining the session. And I guess this is where we're going to have our Q&A time. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them out. If you want to pet the dog, he is free for petting and will absolutely love you. Just don't let him follow you home. And as I mentioned, there are stickers. But thank you all so much for joining. And I'm going to put up my appendix, which I think has my contact info on there. No, it doesn't, but you can find me. So all right, questions? That is interesting. About how long is it taking you to respond to those feature, feature requests and PRs? Is it maybe a time thing? about it 
it up here. Do you have time? Sweet. Okay. So yeah, let's let's dig into that one. Um. This is one of the few fields where being crazy works for you, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, so you mentioned that those are very like sounds, especially around like identifying like community contributors, etc. But we see we see observing our community as well. It seems like we've got a large basic community base, but it's hard to like amplify who they are and where they are and also how amplify their voice basically. Mm. So So that was actually, we feel like that's a kind of challenge of operating a community, a community, active community that they speak up for themselves. Right. We just want to support the thing. Right. But if they're not flowing up to the survey, then it's hard. Like, how do you actually get them? That is a great question. I don't have a clear answer for that. That's something that um, I've, been, I've been kind of like thinking on and working towards for years. The only kind of workaround that I have so far is to, for those who want to be visible, make them hyper visible. Um, there are issues with, or, okay. Um, so there are some people who just don't want to be seen. They want to be active in the project, but they don't want the attention. So meet them halfway. Um, one of the ways that I worked around that at my old job was um, working with the engineering team. If they wanted to um, put together presentations and things like that, but they weren't comfortable getting on stage themselves, I would do it. So um, with the project that I'm managing now, I'm trying to do that same thing. Kata containers, huge, widely used project. Not a lot of engineers are willing to go and like speak in front of hundreds of people about it, so I just volunteered to do it myself. And I also try to keep other people in my pocket who are willing to do the same. Um, I'm not sure if that is a good answer to your question, but that's kind of what I got so far. Quiet you. Yes. So um, one of the ways that we worked around that was to, um, at the time that the feature is being um, created, also engage documentation teams so that, or I guess that's only a good answer if you have a documentation team. Um, if you're a single person or you're working with a very small team and you're trying to put out a new feature and you need to update your docs, the quick and dirty is just to add something about that feature in your release notes and how to use it and then I'll update the docs as quickly as possible afterwards. Quiet you. Any other questions? Anybody want a dog? <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, 
I couldn't hear the last part of your question because it's stupid. Okay. So I've seen a couple of ways that people or that different projects have addressed that. Um, there is RDO. They have their mentorship maintainer list where it's just direct GitHub usernames where you can reach out to someone who's been involved with RDO for a while to walk you through the PR process or the feature request process. Um, that one I am very much a fan of. Some other ways is um, Sandbox. That might be a bit of a heavier lift to set up a full on Git sandbox to walk someone through the PR process, but that works very well for OpenStack, the main project. And um, quick start guides. Just write it out as granularly and as detailed as possible. How to submit a PR, that's helpful. Good reference point. Um, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head for now, but I don't know, maybe we can talk about it a little bit afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been trying to think of different ways to incentivize adding oneself to the maintainers list, but it is very difficult to get people to volunteer. Um, I don't know, let's chat about it. Um, any further, yes? So first off, I'm going to say thank you for coming. I haven't been a student in a very long time, so take this advice from an old person um, with a grain of salt. What? That is a question that I've, I've also been trying to solve for a while. Um, I believe that one of the best ways to get people involved and keep them involved in open source is to show the long-term um, career benefits to working with open source. Because when you say that word, either a person is going to think Microsoft, or they're gonna think, why am I doing work for free? Well, that free work pays off like, like leaps and bounds in the future. I am standing here as proof of that. Um, I would say that highlighting others who started out in open source and where their careers have taken off to would be a great way to um, encourage and keep community involvement from a student perspective because 
remembering 180 years ago when I was a student, one of my main interests was being able to pay for that student thing once I got out. So, I, sure. Um, I am actually, am I over? I think I'm over. Oh, sweet. So, any further questions? Yes. I have a question. I hope I'm not out of line by asking this, but I recently was invited to a group who meets every third Friday called Lunch with Friends, and it, it was with many African American community leaders, entrepreneurs, and so forth. And we even had a special guest, a young lady by the name of Celia, who I believe is running for mayor. Oh. Do this program that you're um, representing reach out to smaller groups like this to help each other in a sense because what we were discussing at this last the first meeting I went to which was last Friday was the housing situation in Austin and elsewhere around the United States homelessness mm. and things of that nature and I would love to try to get some feedback on that and see if we can maybe have those entities work together I love that idea. Um, so I am not a native Austinite. I actually live in New York, but my company, OpenStack slash Open Anchor Foundation, is, I think, based here. That is something that we are absolutely passionate about, and I think that, yes, we can get involved and we can support you. Um, mostly, we deal with nerd, nerd stuff. If you're okay with, like, dealing with some geeky stuff every once in a while, then yes, absolutely, we would love to support you. I'm from Brooklyn myself, so we can make it work. <laughs> All right. Sure. Yes. I was, um, I was talking about this, going back to the statistics earlier in the class. Um, one of the, we were, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but the, the, one of the key points there was the people, um, what I saw was the people who, maybe this is just a few minutes later, but the people who were paid to do a report. Um, um, what seems, they're, they're Well, okay, um, I don't have a quick answer to that. Um, so I guess going back to personal experience, I have been at 5,000 member companies where there was just no way to, um, for the company to really monitor what was happening and to really assure that everyone had equal opportunity. That like, you just, you just can't. And I've also been at smaller companies where there was a direct effort to make sure that opportunities were not afforded to certain people. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to say I don't know instead of saying something stupid. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 I don't know. Um, maybe any suggestions from the audience? Um, that's, that's a tough question. I guess just do the best you can. I mean, at least don't actively work against it. Um, as a company scales, that is very difficult to address. Um, but I don't have a clear cut answer for it, I'm sorry. 
Well, that was disappointing. Any other questions? Questions, comments? Anybody want to put the dog? Yeah. No, it's not a bad note. It's just. Of oh, oh, course, sure. Yeah. The, the, well, so the following up on the question of like, do corporations have responsibilities, then maybe it isn't that you're supposed to have the answer or I'm supposed to have the answer, but that we're supposed to have the answer. So, I mean, I'm, I work with my fellow colleagues on these issues inside our company for sure. And other people I know do too, but maybe we're not. Maybe some more of this job. This is great. We're all here talking about this together, and there's just more chances to do that. So thank you for bringing that. You know, the, yeah, that opens the conversation, and so maybe there's a light light at the end of the tunnel. I guess maybe that's the answer. Start the conversations because that's where things actually happen. You get different perspectives. You get different suggestions. Things that you're not thinking about because you're not impacted by them. Talk to people. So I guess that's a start, and that you actually answered your own thank question. You. Uh oh. <laughs> But that's why we're here. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful Open Source Summit. And if you see Dago and I out and you need a puppy break, that is why we're here. Feel free to cuddle. Thank you all.